Okay, brilliant. Right. Megalea, um, not a very big place, but quite a lot going on and quite a lot to fit in in 20 minutes. Uh, Caving in the Bodhi the Clouds project. Um, situated in northeast Indian. India in the seven uh, union states, as they're called. Um, geologically, it's probably closer to Burma, Myanmar, as it is uh, the rest of India. Uh, the approach via Delhi or originally via Calcutta. Uh, the project takes its name from the Sanskrit meaning of Meghalaya, which is abode of the clouds. Uh, the fact that there's a lot of cloud there at some times, and you've got images of some of the clouds in a minute, and this feature, world record rainfall, warm climate, lots of limestone, many fine caves. And there are the clouds building up in the Bay of Bengal, about to dump lots of rain on Meghalaya. Um, Morsaram holds the world record for the highest amount of rainfall, just under 12 metres a year. Most of that falls between June and uh, the end of August, so you can see it's pretty wet. London, by comparison, has an average of 600 mil, and Manchester, which is considered wet, 800 mil, so uh, quite a lot more. Uh, there are significant limestone deposits in Megalay as well as coal. Uh, the latter resources of economic interest and it's been extracted since the 1800s, um, but it's frequently done with very negative environmental impacts. That's changing, though, because the economics code's coming in from China, and basically uh, they're not digging as much in Megalea. Uh, divided into three administrative areas named after the hills, Garo, Kazi, and uh, Jansha Hills. Um, became an independent state in 72. The three districts I've just mentioned, three main tribes follow the clan system, uh, and it has a matrilineal society where inheritance and lineage follow the mother's line. And there's recently been a Kate Humble uh, documentary on this. The system's remarkably intact, been a bit challenged by modern cultures and values, but it's still very much in place. Uh, Yeah. These are the uh, array of individuals, the Kazis and the Garrow. This is uh, who they are. Uh, Shillong is the capital, uh, old Indian or British hill state. And this is where the limestone is distributed, uh, basically along the southern fringe, and the red dots indicate where the cave exploration has taken place. Scenically, it's plateau, deeply incised valleys, large waterfalls at the end, Interesting root bridges where they weave the roots of uh, the banyan tree together to make these fantastic bridges. The reason the top one's so high is during the wet season, this is how high the water comes up. Um, interesting Megalaya for caving as a result of this cave. This is Siju Dobakol. In 1922, Kemp in Chopra visited the cave as part of an Indian muse museum expedition. And basically... Uh, they recorded the cave, so we knew there was some good cave there. 1.4 kilometers, they mapped at that time in great detail, did a lot of biological surveys, and this passage, though they didn't photograph it then, this was taken in 92, was actually uh, featured on, the, um, on their survey. So they were keen to go back. The problem was, it was from 47 onwards, it was an inner line area, and also restricted area, and it remained a restricted area requiring a restricted area permit um, uh, up until 95, which was a problem in terms of uh, access. I say the caves, very varied, there was sea dune, you've also got a lot of uh, uh, vertical caves as well in some areas, but we didn't know that at that time. Uh, lots of wildlife in the caves, bats, if you get the name Dobakol, it basically means bat cave in Garrow, and Labbit is bat, so Krem, which is the Kazi name for cave and Jansha name for cave, you get lots of Krem Labbits, so lots of little fluffy bats and loads of uh, other creepy crawlies as well. These are the larval stage of the fungal gnat that we affectionately refer to as the snot gobblers. Right, 92, um, that was when the first expedition uh, took place, the British-based uh, expedition, just four of us. A lot of other nationalities and individuals had tried to get access to Megalea, but weren't able to overcome the restricted area permanent. 
Fortunately, at that time, I was working in local government. The British um, left as a legacy in India their very complicated bureaucratic system that the Indians developed. So I understood how it worked and the various idiosyncrasies of it. So 21 months of negotiation, and we eventually got a restricted area permit and went there in 92. Four of us visited the three different hills and nine kilometers of passage. Returned in 94, added another 14 kilometers to it, and in 95, again, with a slightly bigger team, it was eight of us in 94, about 10 in 95, mapped uh, another 10 kilometers in 95. We then began to focus on particular areas rather than moving around, and again, uh, 96, nine kilometers, followed by 97, 25 kilometers, and this was when the Kotsatium Luan system, the first system to reach over 20 kilometers, was. team. Uh, this was in Pilclaim Put, beautiful big river cave. Uh, up till last year, it was uh, just over 13k long in these big gower lakes. Uh, the uh, big gowers that hold back large lakes that require a lot of swimming. Um, middle of the 2000 to the end of 2000, we focused very much on an area known as the Strong Rim Ridge. A lot of um, vertical caves, and just in that area alone over those years, 157 kilometers of cave passage were actually developed, uh, explored. And this is an example of some of the passage. We had camps at that time, large camps, purpose-built on the ridge uh, by the local villagers. Teams were very big, up to 40 in number, and a good time was had by all. 2010, we moved off the Shenongrim Ridge because that was starting to, the yields were getting less and less. And uh, we went to other areas in the Jansha, Umkrapong, again, still getting impressive amounts of uh, passage. Same area in 2011, 2012, again, still in the um, Jansha Hills, but back to an old area in Morzimram where we found another six kilometers sort of further down the hill. So we were starting to return to areas where we'd visited early in the sort of 90s to look more extensively for caves. Uh, 2013, uh, exploration in the Jansha Hills again. Um, in the Kanar area, again, this is South Jansha. Uh, principally, we've not been able to go back to the Garrow um, for about the last eight or nine years because of political difficulties there. 2014 and 2015, Lakadong, area visited in 95 very briefly, returned to in 2014, 2015 uh, to yield a total of 28 kilometers of passage and quite a bit of vertical cave as part of that. Uh, the teams, 2015 in that, getting smaller in size, usually capped at about 24. We've not got the large teams that we had on the, um, on the hill. Uh, so again, a bit more manageable. This is the expedition truck that we purchased in 2011 that we used for moving stuff around. And this is the team. There's always been a focus on getting a good number of uh, women cavers as part of the caving team. That's been a feature. We have what I call the girly quota. And basically, caving in the Bode of the Clouds does not run boys only expeditions because some of our best cavers are our female cavers. Uh, 2016, um, again in the Jansha Hills, the Sakwar area, where we did a recce and we'd return to this year, and then into Morzinram, Molongba, where we got another 17 and a half kilometers 
of Cave. 2017, so dwell on the recent uh, expedition. Again, still very British sort of format. Um, staying in the local village. Uh, and again, 13.8 kilometers of cave, 7.7 7 in the Jantia Hills, and back to Moors where we got another 6.1. Um, things don't often go to uh, plan. Uh, this wasn't exactly how we intended to unload the vehicle at camp this year, but I succeeded in turning it over just two kilometers before the camp. But fortunately, I just end, ended up with just a scratch on my head and a dented pride, but there you go. Uh, the camps based in the village, all the modern facilities, say drying room, toilet, and outside shower, all works very well. Unusual sort of camp life, which is coming back, having surveyed lots of caves, putting stuff into the computers, celebrating people's birthdays, and sitting around the fire drinking beer. We may not be good for records, but in terms of actually records for having a good time exploring some good caves, caving the boat of the clouds does pretty well. Two of the key ones for this year was Pilclaim Puck that I mentioned. We linked that to Krem Sakwa, taking it to 18.6 kilometers. It's now India's third longest cave. And this is some of the very fine passage and some very fine photographs, I might add, that are in it. Mixture of dry passage and beautiful river passage. Some swimming involved and a few cascades. It was the 25th year of exploration this year. And this was celebrated by a party. We had a special cave made a special cake made with a cave inside. You can see an example of it here. And it was cut by myself and Thomas, Thomas from Switzerland, that principally involved in organising the current expeditions. Um, you can tell that Thomas is Swiss because he's got a kilt on. And you can tell that I'm British because I'm holding a drink in my hand. Right, anyway, we move on. Um, we then went back to the Moors in Ram area uh, and Krempuri Fairy Cave. We caved there first in 92, didn't realise that this cave existed. And it's only been uncovered by the locals in the last few years, but it's proven extremely interesting. Last year, 8.2 kilometres. This year, 12.3. Labyrinth Cave could become the longest stand, stone cave in the world, so we may well have a record. And this is the, sort of some of the passages in it. Beautiful passage, very interesting. Totally in sandstone, but all the features of a limestone cave big canyon passage and other bits that are not quite so big. And you can see here the contrasting survey. Top left is last year and uh, bottom right is sort of uh, this year and potential to extend uh, and become world's longest known sandstone cave. Uh, these are all the activities that have taken place over the last 25 years. Uh, there's still a lot of secrets to be found. We always get a few nice surprises each year and sometimes even the odd fairy tale but that's Megalaya. Um, to date 1,635 cave sites known, 1,003 of them have been explored, 648 kilometres of survey passage and Megalaya seems to keep on giving which is great. Uh, length longest one found so far is just over 30 kilometres, not particularly deep. The caves in Megalaya get their length, get their depth because of their long length going gently downhill, uh, but a reasonable few now up in the sort of around the 20 kilometres. Um, sunset in India is because of the dust, you get some beautiful sunsets. This represents quite nicely modern developments in India. You've got looking from the village over the unspoilt forest. And that is the Lumshnong massive cement plant that rumbles ceaselessly through the night. And this is quite an interesting juxtaposition of the very typical and traditional and the sort of very modern and potentially quite destructive. Uh, thanks to Brian Carpandale and the Megalayan Adventurers. And acknowledgement is also given to our funders from time to time. Uh, thanks also to the photographs, particularly this year. We got some wonderful photographs. Uh, if you want more, we have books. Speak to me afterwards. Get your hands in your pocket and get one on your coffee table. And Caving in the Bodhi of the Clouds, Meghalaya in India, a distinctly British-flavoured expedition to be continued. Thank you very much. <laughs>